Right. Good morning, everyone. Today's um, talk is titled Micropolitics at uh, the Border. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, Mariana Karakulaki, uh, Lisa Seneco, uh, Ruta Inke. We're supposed to also have Matthew Quartz, who is not uh, able to, to be here for some technical issues in uh, the field site. Um, I'm very happy to, to chair this panel because uh, I think that uh, the three presentations will uh, have some very interesting points uh, of uh, interconnections. Um, in particular, we are trying to deal with the idea of micropolitics and the, rate, the relationship between uh, the state and migrant experiences in different settings and, and regions. Uh, in this sense, uh, asking how does politics uh, turn into micropolitics, and uh, what are the methodologies that uh, we can adopt to speak of the dead or for the dead, uh, while displaying the violent system which allows, maintains and reproduces the very conditions in which death can and does uh, take place. Now, very quickly, um, Mariana will uh, lead us through the dark space that opens up once the spectacle of the border is uh, over. Uh, so she will ask, uh, discuss about what happens behind the formal and institutional representation of state presence. A little bit of what we said yesterday as well. And where, where, where is a responsibility to be found? And how does politics affect life to become micro politics? Uh, Lisa will uh, tell us a little bit about the role, importance, and significance of deathnography, which is a way of making sense of uh, migrant death. So, in her presentation, she will focus on the question of mapping Malta's border regime via the afterlife of the migrants. So writing about, of, and around death, uh, she will argue, I think, can become an illuminating method to critically address the challenges and also the limitations of border spaces. While Ruta, finally, will discuss the question of the violence of the state in relation to migrants' experiences of border crossing in both uh, Afghanistan, Iran, and Iran, Turkey. Um, so how are living, moving, and dying bodies treated in, en route? And how does the experience of crossing the border tell us something uh, meaningful about the relationship that exists between the state and the people we refer to as, as migrants? Um, so, without uh, wasting any, like, too much time on, 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 on this, I, I, I think I will start by uh, quickly introducing uh, Mariana and let uh, the talk work. Um, so, yeah, Mariana is, is currently a part-time PhD researcher at the University of uh, Birmingham. Birmingham. Uh, her thesis positioning had a border violence along the Balkan route. Uh, the Necropolitics of Fortress Europe explores refugee experiences of borders, violence, and death through a necropolitical lens. Uh, but Mariana is also an award journalist and a photojournalist who focuses on migration in the Eastern Mediterranean and currently works as the communication manager for Media Diversity Institute. Um, so, uh, hi everyone, thank you for being here this early in the morning. Uh, my presentation is entitled The Political uh, Thanatos, which means death in grace. So I'm going to look, uh, I'm going to give an overview of uh, the numbers of death in grace, uh, refugee deaths specifically, 
then I'm going uh, into a case study at the Evros River at the eastern, uh, northern eastern Greece, uh, which is the mainland border with Turkey. And then I'm, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, two concepts that I've been uh, experimenting, if not playing lately, fragile realities and how those fragile realities lead to political thanatos. Uh, so what's in the number? Uh, documenting death, uh, refugee deaths in Greece is not the easiest thing. Uh, and this is because uh, Greece does not keep any records about refugee deaths. And uh, the data that we have either come from uh, hospitals, and these hospitals are in, uh, in the island, specifically Lesbos keeps a record. And um, the hospital of Alexandrupol in northern Greece keeps a record as well. Um, the UNHCR keep a death, uh, a record as well, uh, but uh, there, it's not entirely accurate. And uh, we know that it's not entirely accurate because the Associated Press did a research a few years ago on the Missing Migrants Project, and they saw that uh, that number is actually double on the actual number. So in order to actually find uh, the numbers of death, uh, we need to look at these records, of course, but then we have to talk to people who were present during uh, death at the border. Uh, another issue that uh, happens in Greece is that we're not entirely sure how to define border death. So, for example, in 2015, a uh, migrant died on, a, on the, was electrocuted on, in uh, Idomene, the Greek Macedonian border. Is this considered a border death or is it considered a, um, an accident? So, Greece does not take it as a border death, it takes it as an accident. So, these numbers are not documented as border deaths. Uh, so from 1990 until uh, 2013, we had 843 deaths, and this is this has been documented by the Human Cost of Border Control Project. And um, the way that they documented those numbers is by looking only at official numbers, and they did not look at the Turkish side of the border. And from 2014 until uh, 2021, we have had 2,104 uh, dead or missing in Greece. So this. Uh, number includes both the missing and the dead, whereas the previous one does not include the missing. Uh, now let's move to Evros. Evros is part of the Eastern Mediterranean migratory route. It's uh, one of the most popular, it was one of the most popular routes uh, for migrants, for people on the move in Greece until 2012. It has started becoming popular now as well. It's also one of the most important areas in Greece from a diplomatic point of view and this is because it is the only land border that Greece has with Turkey. Uh, it is an area very rich in uh, ethnic and religious diversity uh, and it's an area that is uh, constantly contested by Turkey especially when uh, uh, disagreements rise like in this period for example. Um, the river is shared between three countries, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Greece. But here I'm only looking at uh, uh, Turkey and Greece. It, it is shared equally as defined by the law of the sea. Uh, but Turkey has a 12 kilometer stretch. And that stretch, you can see it uh, with that arrow there. And this is important because it's also where the only fence, the first fence that was built in Europe, I think, uh, it was built there in 2012. Uh, and it was built specifically to prevent uh, migrant crossings. Um, it is an area extremely beautiful, but it is an area full of death. Until 2010, there were anti-personnel landmines um, that were implanted after the Second World War. And in 1974, uh, when Turkey invaded Cyprus, uh, the Greek uh, government, the dictatorship that we had at the time, implanted 25,000 more anti-personnel and anti-tank um, um, mines. Uh, and I'm mentioning this specifically but it is quite, because it is quite important when it comes to migrant deaths, and I will go into it a bit uh, later on. Um, and as I mentioned, it is one of the most commonly used uh, uh, routes it was until uh, 2012, and it's becoming popular now as well. Um, this is the border fence that uh, separates Greece and Turkey. Um, and you can see the, the stretch of land, uh, well, kind of see the stretch of land behind this. And it says, uh, be careful, uh, borderline, break Turkey's borders. Uh, as I mentioned, Evros is full of death. And uh, 
I visited the area a few times and for me it's the most militarized and scariest places that I've seen. I haven't been able to go next to the river because once you cross uh, the field, you get arrested. And if you go as a journalist, then uh, you usually have a crew with you, so you, you will be safe. The most common uh, causes of death for people on the move are hypothermia, drowning, landmines until 2010, and traffic accidents. Even though the landmines were quite, according to the Greek military, they were well uh, guarded, uh, people, uh, when they were moving, they would usually lose their way and they would find themselves themselves there. So they will step on a landmine and they will explode. And we have had uh, uh, the coroner of uh, Alexandropoli, for example, he was explaining how they, were, they, would, they wouldn't find a full uh, body. Um, when it comes to hypothermia, along with drowning, they're the two most popular causes of death. And this happens because, uh, if you have heard, uh, Greece is quite uh, okay with uh, illegal pushbacks. So for people to avoid being detected by the military or, or by the police in the area, they usually hide around, um, once they, they cross, they hide uh, around the river banks. Uh, if they stay there along, uh, throughout the night, they will freeze to death. So the next morning they will be found um, uh, dead by hypothermia. And when it comes to drowning, even though the, the stretch of the river is quite short, it's uh, quite muddy. So according to the coroner, the water drags you down. And when people cross, they usually wear several layers of clothes. And this means these, uh, these, these layers work as um, extra weight. So they, they drag you down and these bodies are, sometimes they're not found uh, anywhere. Uh, and traffic accidents, um, when people walk trying to find their way away from the military and the border police, they use different uh, routes. Uh, sometimes they find themselves around the train line, so they're, they're being hit by trains. Or sometimes when they uh, live with smugglers who are in the area, they're being chased by the police, then they crash and then they die. These deaths are not considered border deaths by Greece, so I'm not sure if they are documented as such. Um, in this photo you can see this is the coroner of Alexandropol and he has done extremely uh, important work in, uh, in academia as well when it comes to forensics and uh, migration. Um, the number of deaths has increased so much that the International uh, uh, Committee of the Red Cross had to give extra fridges that, that are kept outside of uh, his lab so that they keep the dead and um, at that time there were around 20 bodies inside the fridges. Uh, apologies if the, these pictures are distressing, by the way. Um, so the examination at the coroner follows international um, forensic standards. And the examination takes place so that uh, they can um, collect some data about the dead. Uh, those standards include uh, sex, estimated age, detailed anthropometric characteristics, um, for example, height, weight, and uh, similar characteristics. Anatomical peculiarities, for example, there was a case of someone who had uh, a lamp on his ear, and this way they were able to identify who that person was. Uh, personal belongings and clothing, if they are, if they are in a good state. Uh, the location of death that is uh, usually given by the authorities. Uh, time when the body was found, an estimated time of death, and when it comes to the estimated time of death, usually the people who are traveling with the person who perished help with uh, the estimation. Um, the condition of the body remains, cause of death, and DNA sampling. And when it comes to DNA sampling, uh, these data are kept and they're being sent to the labs in Athens, where they are kept for uh, reasons of uh, further dedication, identification by their families. Uh, later on. And if it's uh, uh, possible, they keep dental evidence, figure printing, and post-mortem computerized tomography of decomposed remains. And um, this usually happens with uh, victims of drowning or people who are found quite later um, on when they're in the sta state of de um, decomposition. Uh, specifically, uh, the coroner of Alexandrupoli, uh, his name is Pavlos Pavlidis, by the way, um, he, keep, he keeps a uh, people's personal items. Uh, he keeps records of people's tattoos, uh, which help with identification. And uh, he, keeps, he gives every 
person, they, he gives them a specific uh, identification number, and this number is usually written on uh, the people's graves later on. And contrary to what happens in Greece in general, he keeps the body of a migrant for 90 days. Uh, Greek law says that it has to be kept 10 days. If that body has not been claimed by anyone, they, they, it usually ends up in, um, uh, in the labs of university hospitals. Uh, in Lesbos, they keep these bodies uh, for uh, 30 days, if I'm not mistaken, but Pavlos Pavlidis keep them, keeps them for 90 days because he had uh, cases of people going three months later to claim uh, their loved ones. And um, once this process takes place, then there is a transnational collaboration with uh, embassies uh, if they manage to establish someone's uh, nationality and uh, international organizations. Uh, these are the items that uh, he keeps, for example. Uh, several people have, have been found with uh, photos on them. Other people have uh, family photos, uh, personal belongings, uh, money and phones. So these uh, items usually help with the identification and the claiming of the body. Um, this is a quite uh, interesting to me, which I actually found quite uh, recently. Um, there is no law that regulates death in Greece. Death is regulated by the laws that we have that regulate life. So, for example, death is regulated by the Article 2 of the Greek Constitution, which, which is about the respect and protection of the value of the human being, as well as uh, the human... Now I have the Greek name in my, in my head. Um, by the International uh, Human Rights... The European Union Human Rights uh, Convention, which is the wrong name, but I think you understand which one I mean. <laughs> Um, so death is regulated by the laws that we have about life. Um, and there is a, a specific uh, way that uh, death is regulated. First, it has to be uh, documented. So, and this, these laws are for everyone. Doesn't matter if you're a great citizen, doesn't matter if you have been, uh, if you're someone who, is not, uh, who has not been identified. Um, and another interesting fact is that uh, this law about documentation and burial has been established during the Greek dictatorship that was infamous for human rights violation and uh, racism in, in the country. So to document someone, the relatives are primarily responsible. If there is no one, uh, if there is uh, no one that is a relative of, of, of the dead, uh, then the, the person who has been present during death has to document this, uh, the dead. And if not, then the funeral home takes charge. The person who documents death needs to provide medical certificate of the cause of death issued by a doctor. In the case of Evers, it happens by the coroner. Um, if autopsy is not possible or due to, or for example, for religious is, uh, issues, um, the, 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 there cannot be any form of uh, uh, medical examination on the body, uh, then the public prosecutor uh, has to issue an order in order to document the dead. Uh, one of the most interesting elements of this is that uh, the person who documents the death needs to submit their identification documents as well as the identification document of the deceased. And uh, at the same time, they have to provide the tax identification number as well as the social security number, which in the case of uh, people who perish on the borders is not really possible because usually they don't have any identification uh, documents. Uh, from uh, 2014, to 2016, the number of deaths were so high in Greece that there was a huge problem uh, of uh, burial. Uh, those who are responsible for the burial of the dead in Greece are uh, the municipalities. Uh, so basically, there's no place to uh, bury the dead, and the dead of the Evros River are being buried on, uh, on, on the Muslim cemeteries of the region, as well as the Orthodox cemeteries if they're in different regions, but outside of the cemetery area. So I only have five minutes, but I don't think I will need more for that. Um, so what I mean about fragile realities, I think that uh, people who, who walk along the borders live in fragile realities. And these fragile realities take place during migratory journeys. Uh, for those, uh, and they use, these fragile realities, they work as a circle. It's a circle of hope, hope that I will go somewhere, I will build a new life, abandonment, uh, during the journey, despair, 
And this circle breaks once they reach their final uh, stage of the journey, once they reach where they want to go, or once this journey is uh, cut abruptly. Uh, and in this case, this fragile reality is cut during, uh, the fra during uh, death. And as we have seen, uh, death is a result of the border. And I personally think that the border is inherently violent and the border is violence it's itself. And, uh, well, I lost my um, um, way of uh, speaking. Um, so we take two examples. First, we have this image of Oilan Kurdi, uh, drawn by a refugee girl at the, a domain, in the domain of the Greek Macedonian border. Uh, his death changed politics. It led to, the, to an open border politics in, um, in, uh, in Germany. And then, uh, two years ago, we had the death of Muhammad al-Arabi, who was shot dead by the Greek uh, military. Greece still denies that this happened by the Greek authorities. So his death, uh, both deaths, deaths have a symbolism. One has the symbolism of hope, and the other one has the, the symbolism of denial. Um, and one was used for change, and the other one was used for blame. So all these deaths in Greece are highly politicized. And they're quite different from uh, my death, for example. If I die, my death is, is not gonna have this kind of importance that uh, the deaths of the, the people of the move, move uh, people on the move have. Uh, this being said, uh, thank you. <laughs> Very much. A uh, lot of interesting points and questions about how we have to do this. So, um, uh, Lisa, uh, who is for our first now instead, is a, a PhD candidate in migration at the Institute of Social Sciences at CU Lisboa. Her research converges around the intersection of race, class, and uh, migratory spaces with the concepts of non citizenship, hierarchies, and mobility, justice as focal uh, points. Uh, titled Mapping Malta, a study of the regime of borders through structures and non citizen subjectivities. Her thesis aims to disentangle constructed aspects of the regime of borders in Malta from those experienced by the non citizens who engage them. Uh, is that the floor is, is yours? Thank you. I'm noticing the formatting is a bit off, so just roll with it. I will as well. Um, so it was by turning over and over the saying, death is the great equalizer, that deathnography began. I was clear I wanted one of the angles of my dissertation to address death in migratory contexts, and I knew I'd focus on Malta, but it wasn't until I got stuck on this adage that the question would follow. What if the same kinds of inequalities experienced during life in Malta by border crossers who cross extra legally were reproduced in death? It was possible that death had the potential to equalize and it would be worthwhile also to discover what kinds of processes would be necessary in order to create such conditions. The title of this presentation is Mapping Malta's Regime of Borders Through Deathnography. I'll begin by laying out the concept and framework of regime of borders that I'm working from, and I'll conclude with a clarification of what deathnography is and its limitations. My aim in this presentation, though, is to take you with me to Adalorata Cemetery. Uh, it's in Malta, and it's a space within which both death and Malta's borders are made material, concrete. Here, from my perspective, and nascent research, this is one place where we can find borders practiced. Three questions guide this presentation. First, what comprises Malta's regime of borders? Second, how does deathnography help to materialize or objectify the borders? And finally, why deathnography? What is it and what are its limitations? Okay, I had planned to conduct field work for this study before this conference, but like many things over the past two years, it was canceled. I went back to data collection from my preliminary 
a field work trip in July and August of last year. And I'll present some data that I've also been able to collect remotely since then. I'll focus on how I plan to move forward in my next field work trip with Fanatic Ethics generous support plan for July and August. I especially welcome feedback in this space. What has worked for you? Or how and where might I find the borders materialized? So briefly, I want to address what comprises Malta's regime of borders. To be clear, the dominant term in the literature is border regime. Most of the citations I'm re relying on do so. I'm appropriating Balabar's prepositional phrase, the regime of borders, because I think it expresses the nature of the apparatus in an important way. The regime is singular, but the borders are plural. The singularity is in that these devices intersect to establish the apparatus, the regime itself, but that the devices are a plurality, a complexity that signify at times cohesion and at other times contradiction. The term regime of borders signifies then a singularity and that these devices are related of the same order and maintain the purpose of separating and producing, controlling movement and classifying people, but are also a plurality, variation, multiplicity with regard to situatedness, placement or location of the borders. Borders are elusive in that they, in some senses, places and contexts take on qualities of an illusion. That is, borders appear to be something they are not. For example, border control with a passport that allows you to easily enter. Or they exist in places that they are not thought to exist. Country of origin or restrictions for visas. And they equally exist in places that it seems they do not. Discrimination, segregation. Borders are elusive in that they allude or suggest indirectly or refer to something else. An illusion in this sense is a wink or a nod, an inference, indirectly referential, pointing towards something understood or known without being explicit. Here I'm thinking about the external borders as an allusion to colonial hierarchies, classifications, and structurings. And finally, borders are elusive in that they are difficult to pin down. They elude or escape those who pursue them. In essence, they defy capture. For all these reasons, I aim to focus on the differential practices at and the differential experiences of the border. Contemporary scholars have used different language to convey their observations and interpretations about borders in their current iteration. In 2009, Sashar observed national borders are increasingly becoming more open and more closed than in the past. More recently, she's posited the concept of the shifting border which is a legal wall, quote, that variably shrinks, expands, disappears, and reappears across space and time in the service and managed and selective migration and mobility regimes. In 2009, Balabar dubbed the function of the internal and external borders of the EU as a way of establishing and maintaining a European apartheid. In 2015, Cresswell designated the concept geographies of citizenship to explain the differential experiences of the new global elite and the shadow citizens. In 2018, Mavelli observed this, the selective openness and closure of borders in accordance with a rewriting of the principles of citizenship, such as reciprocity, equality, and solidarity in economic terms. Note, not just a replacement of those principles with economic ones. So through an ethnographic approach that disarticulates the institutional, physical, conceptual, and the experiential arms of the border, this project challenges a strict territorial or relational approach. Through this disarticulation, it becomes possible to mine, as Posse suggests, practices, symbols, realities, processes, institutions, networks, as well as the subjective experiences of distinct non-citizens as units of analysis. This approach makes it possible to test empirically some of those theoretical proposals just mentioned, but also the claims of such authors as Mbembe, Hart and Negri, Munson Lloyd, and De Geneva, as well as again, Balabar, 
that certain bodies actually constitute the borders of Europe. By following, adapting, and cobbling together Vacchiano and Posse's framework, this project centers the border as a construction and an experience, as material and symbolic, as productive of something new and changing, as well as being reflective of something always already there. Now, <clears throat> let's turn to materializing the border. In August 2021, I visited Adolorata Cemetery, a place that I argue constitutes Malta's institutional borders as a space grounded in admittedly very confusing bureaucratic procedures and its conceptual borders as a representation and manifestation of the often internalized categories which influence decisions about where certain bodies belong. One of the greatest challenges to navigate in this border space is the divorce system of record keeping. Upon arriving at the cemetery, I established a contact who had been working there for several years. I presumed there would be bodies of migrants who had died crossing, been recovered and then buried in the cemetery. So I asked where these bodies were located. I was handed a map, similar to this one. And okay, now I lost my place, sorry. I was handed a map of the cemetery and took notes as I was uh, relayed information. This contact seemed really reluctant to talk, but also certain that there were currently no bodies of migrants in the cemetery, assuring me, this is a quote, that about five years ago, there were about 35 to 40 bodies who, sorry, migrants who died in the Mediterranean and were buried here. She, but this, this person told me that by law, those bodies only need to stay for two years before their bones are placed in a separate place within the cemetery, and that there were currently no bodies of migrants buried within the cemetery. So I wanna show you this place. I recorded images and videos as I made my way through the cemetery. I recorded my impressions, sensations, and intuitions, but I'm not gonna play the sound as I used this contact's name as you may have noticed, I'm kind of performing a little linguistic gymnastics right now, trying not to reveal any information about these contacts. Malta is a really small place, and I think um, because of this, people are very reluctant to talk. So I made the, this recording for myself. Uh, this one here, I think. So... Yeah, I made this recording so that I could get back in there. Um, this is Pink, uh, Sarah Pink. Um, so while the information that the contact had just relayed to me uh, was fresh in my mind, and, and so I could remember the things that I wanted to remember. So first here, we have the private plots. Um, this is just one part of the cemetery here. This is a, an image of the Chapel of Our Lady. Um, it's central in the cemetery. I read uh, somewhere that the cemetery was built around this as a central point. It seems to me that this is so, but I, I need to still confirm this. There are a few comments and interpretations as well as layers that I wanna share about the materialization, objectification and symbolism of both death and borders that I observed and was struck by within the cemetery. The cemetery itself is death materialized and also a sanitized mediation. This is of course my interpretation. Some would say it's a purification or something else entirely. It seems all at once to objectify, symbolize and transform death. This of course is a space for the living to get in touch with, accept and integrate the death of someone into their life. The symbolic, cultural and individual meanings and processes that take place within this space will of course differ. My interpretation is that the common graves seen here in section BA materialize and objectify marginality. These are the bodies buried at the back along the wall that is the edge of the cemetery, the back door, the service entrance and exit, literal and symbolic marginality. The bodies buried here exist in the margins of death materialized, but they're also centered along the main aisle. Did that already play through? Yeah. 
So here we go. From a film called Counting, made in 2014, that followed Last and her team on research trips in the Southern, uh, Southern Europe, European Mediterranean, working on naming and counting the anonymous dead, we know that there have been bodies of would-be border crossers buried here. In that film, Lass is struck by the fact that these bodies are buried with what she calls Maltese paupers in the common graves. So there is something striking about how these would-be border crossers who die en route, never making it to Malta, are buried together with Maltese people, a kind of integration. It's also true that the ways in which these migrants died is far from normal or regular. I really need more time to think this through and understand more details and context before determining how I interpret all of this. I looked at the headstones and markers, which were temporary and movable, propped up, a bit scattered, sometimes more than one located on top of one plot, sometimes off to the side as if not exact, but giving a general idea of where a body might be. Most of these stones had a name, dates, a small picture of the person, some religious symbol, some were shaped as hearts. I took some time to look at the names on these stones and each appeared to me to be Maltese. This of course could be my bias, my ignorance, or also just chance. So as this contact mentioned, it looked as if there was a whole section toward the back of the main aisle over here, um, where they had cleared out the graves due to COVID, right? And they were anticipating more death. But now here comes a little twist, oh boy. Within the last month through remote research, I was able to establish contact with the individuals in Malta responsible for performing autopsies on all bodies, including the bodies of migrants who were covered in the Mediterranean. I learned that there may in fact have been bodies of migrants buried in Adolorata while I was there. This contact confirmed that all bodies recovered receive an autopsy and that the date set the data set shared with me confirms that there are some bodies pending burial and some already buried. I can't be sure if the bodies I was looking for were buried in the cemetery when I was there in late August, 2021, but this contradiction is puzzling to me. From the data set, you can see the contact at the cemetery remembered the dates just a bit off, that in 2015, there had been 25 bodies recovered and buried in Adolorata, but in 2014, there had been 32 which I would think would be more memorable. But it also seems likely that in 2021, there could have been at least one body buried there. As I said, I didn't see headstones or markings of any kind that indicated the bodies I was searching for were buried there. Okay, I'm the first to recognize I still don't have names or stories or people willing to share. I'm still enumerating bodies, listing them in a chart, anonymous. How does one trace a subject when the subject is no longer living? More than this, how does one trace that subject in places and spaces where they're marginal, invisible, or forgettable? I take two questions posed by Mimbe very seriously here. Imagining politics as a form of war, we must ask, what place is given to life, death, and the human body, in particular the wounded or slain body? How are they inscribed in the order of power? There's a theme emerging in my research, in interviews with government officials and in off the record anonymous conversations with a former rescuer with the armed forces of Malta. I see it in media coverage and investigative journalism, the idea that many things in Malta are open secrets. I can provide more examples um, about this later, but for now I need to turn to ethnography. Just to say that these open secrets seem to me to intersect with the conditions that allow deaths at the border to take place. It has a strong anti-Black undergirding. A lot is happening non-verbally in these interactions and I'm learning to trust what place my intuition has in the research. In 1998, Balabar observed borders are no longer at the borders and suggested that people become borders. At first I thought deathnography would be focused on the death journey mobility just before and just after death at the borders, but this is evolving. One aspect that I think has been clarified is that it's not only about death at the borders or even the death journey, but that these deaths materialize a border that exists only for non-citizens who attempt to migrate to Malta or claim asylum in Malta 
or who have access only in this specific way. Death in this sense becomes the material manifestation of a segregated border, separate but equal, which we all know is not equal. This is one of the features of segregation. Deathnography assumes that unearthing and tracing the after-death journeys of this group of border-crossing non-citizens will reveal important novel empirical data about where we might delineate or locate territorially and physically, as well as conceptually, metaphysically, and experientially, where Malta's borders can be said to exist. Deathnography is a tool for comparing unequal mobilities. Personally, I found that one of the most difficult aspects of deathnography is engaging it. That is opening up the conversation with my co-researchers. Building trust has taken time. I've only recently begun asking if people know anyone who knows anyone who might be ready to share their experiences. I'm treading lightly in this space. I can also say more on that later. My initial plan was to trace the after-death migration journeys of five would-be extra-legal border crossers. Significantly during preliminary research, what I found was that this tracing may lead me into Libya and into the soil, literally, dead bodies pushed back and buried there and the living into de detention centers. And metaphysically, unlike Maltese detention centers, although also opaque, these detention centers materialize a social death incomparable. And so at this point, I've opened up the possibility of deathnography as a way of exploring the social death of living border crossers detained, if there's any way I can make contact. I'll also remain open to tracing the death journeys of those buried in Malta or Libya, if that's possible. I'm aware that I need to end. Uh, so I'll conclude with another Mumbai quote. In reality, it is the body of the African, of every African taken individually, and of all Africans as a racial class that constitutes today the borders of Europe. This new type of human body is not only the skin body and the abject body of epidermal racism, that of segregation, it's also the border body, which traces the limit between those who are us and those who are not and whom one can maltreat with impunity. At this point in the evolution of deathnography, the goal is to follow the subjectivity of the border body, locate that body in time and place, open up the space of what we can know by engaging the migratory worlds of those border crossers through their own words if living, and if not, through the stories and accounts of family, friends, loved ones, and fellow travelers. By following, tracing, deepening what we know about the subjective experience of those border crossers, we might come to understand the ways in which they are inscribed in the order of power, Mbembe, or in Syed's words, the sociology of the state, or the limits of, in Pessarini's words, the racial nation, or also the racial, the racial imaginary of Europe, European space. Only then might we be able to deracinate the unnatural hold, the death grip these borders have on so many aspects of that ordering. Thank you.